free blacks that could own property like lithographer Grifton, Taylor, Brown, and cabinet maker Darrell Bajan and Thomas Day established their businesses in keenly competitive districts and succeeded. African American fine artists developed from various social and economic conditions before and after the Civil War, such as the ending of the slave trade, the expansion of, bl of free black communities, and a growing middle and wealthy class of Americans. Most free fine artists were mulattoes, whose color and education in Europe were sponsored by a parent or a abolitionist society. Their access to higher standards of training provided in the cities gave them privileges over darker skinned blacks. However, whenever possible, blacks had the same careers as whites. They had professional art training, the European Grand Tour, patrons, critical acceptance, and public visibility through local or regional art exhibitions and viewing. Now, during the antebellum period, most of the artist patrons were European Americans and black abolitionists. After the Civil War, black community leaders became patrons. Julian Hudson was an upper class free man of mixed race. He was one of many free men of color who had a prosperous professional career as an artist, a writer, a, and a musician in Annabellum, New Orleans. This is one of his paintings called Creole Boy with a Moth. This is the Creole artist's only self-portrait from the Annabellum period. Only four to six signed oil paintings by Hudson have been identified, two of which are owned by the Louisiana State Museum. However, in 2011, the Gibbs Museum of Art, co-organized by the Worcestershire Art Museum and the Historic New Orleans Collection, presented a new exhibit called In Search of Julian Hudson, Free Artists of Color in Pre-Civil War New Orleans. It was the first retrospective of the brief but essential career of Julian Hudson, one of the earliest documented free artists of color working in the 19th century. Many New Orleans shoemakers, cigar makers, iron workers, furniture makers, and lithographers were free African Americans. Another artist, Julian Lyon, was one of the most prominent daguerreotypist lithographers and painters, a free man of color. He was born in Paris, France in 1816 and spent most of his adult life in New Orleans. When Lyons returned from France in 1839, he introduced the U.S. to the daguerreotype, an early form of photography that was invented in Paris by Louis Jacques Duguero. Because this was a new picture-taking process from overseas, some believe Lyon's work gave birth to photography in the United States, especially among blacks. He was among the first blacks to be known as a daguerreotype photographer, spreading quickly to other black photographers like James Presley Ball. He photographed landmarks in New Orleans and was in demand by notables such as President Andrew Jackson and President Martin Van Buren. In New Orleans, the New Orleans Bee, a local bilingual newspaper, hired Lyon to photograph, um, to photograph for the publication. Unfortunately, Lyon's daguerreotypes are rare in terms of identifying them. I'm assuming he didn't sign them. And so what you're looking at is a rare image of his, and this is a daguerreotype, and it's simply titled Unknown Woman, and there's not even a date for this particular one. Two heirloom ambrotype. Ambrotype is a process that replaces a daguerreotype, but two ambrotypes of Mr. and Mrs. Jean Baptist Terzini are recognized as being uh, Jules Lyon's work. You're looking at the um, Ambrotype called Mr. Jean Baptist Trezzini, and this is from 1860. You can tell uh, there's a little damage, but you can get an idea of what Mr. Uh, Jean Baptist looked like. On the other hand, this is a portrait that has sustained a lot of damage. So we're looking at the reverse side of this Ambrotype 
of Miss Jean Baptist Tresini, and this is from 1860. The ambrotype was introduced in Britain in 1854 by Frederick Scott Archer and commercialized in the United States by James Cutting. Ambrotypes are a negative images that are produced on a glass plate and viewed as positive by adding a black, some sort of black backing, and that black backing is normally uh, velvet. This is a view of Camp Street in New Orleans. This is from 1858, and it really shows you how popular uh, this early form of photography was. Uh, again, we see some um, amber types and daguerreotype uh, studios. Jules Lyon was also a successful painter, exhibiting at the 1833 Exposition in Paris. In 1848, he opened an art school on Exchange Street, and in 1865, he became a professor of drawing at Louisiana College. This is a rare 1840s romantic period Louisiana school charcoal drawing. It's a portrait of a young, handsome gentleman in a suit. This portrait has been attributed to both Jules Lyon as well as Julian Hudson, because both of these artists were free men of color in the antebellum South in New Orleans around this particular time, and apparently this is not a signed drawing. The drawing is, however, in its original lemon gold gilded oval frame um, and under its original wavy bubble glass. Jewel Lyons lived in New Orleans until his death, and much of his work features the city's architectures and portraits of his leading uh, citizens. Let's talk a little bit about what's called vernacular antebellum architecture. So let's break that word down. Vernacular means common. We know that antebellum means before the war. And we know that architecture um, can be domestic, functional, or it can be monumental, right? But when we're talking about vernacular antebellum architecture, we're talking about common architecture that was created before the war for, you could say, probably regular people, right? Slaves and free African Americans, builders and designers created this, what's called vernacular architecture. A few were trained formally, but most were trained as apprentices for European or European-American architects and builders. The Fabre Merger was a Creole of color suburb outside of New Orleans. It's an excellent example of an area where free blacks like Louis Nelson Fouget, who was active in between 1830 and 1855. He was trained as a mason, an architect, and a mathematician in Jamaica. He designed and built this incredible, substantial brick structure at the corner of Chartreuse and Manville Street uh, in New Orleans. The other architects and builders were Laurent Ousey Guno. He was active in 1820s. And then you had William Kincaid. He was active between 1820 to 1840s. And then Jean Louis Dalio, who was active from 1779 to 1861. He designed modest townhouses like the one you see here. This is the image of a French Creole cottage. And this type of cottage dominated the Creole suburb from 1810 to 1830. This image that you see here is considered Louis Dalio's masterpiece Creole cottage design. Few of these remain today, unlike the shotgun house. There are two building types. There's the French Creole cottage and the African Caribbean structure called the shotgun house. You're looking at one of New Orleans' original shotgun houses. The leading African-American contribution to American vernacular architectural design is the shotgun house, which has been roughly built to be about 12 to 20 feet. Shotgun houses are still prevalent in the South because of their efficient use of land, their modest cost, and suitability to the climate. The distinctive form of the house dates from 1810 to the present. 
It is a formal link with African and Caribbean architecture. It is attributed to French Creoles and free black Creoles from St. Dominguez and Cuba who migrated to New Orleans and Charleston, South Carolina from 1784 to 1810. They brought the architectural plan of the shotgun house from Haiti as an urban alternative to the Creole cottage style. The Haitian shotgun house is a mixture of Yoruba from Nigeria, West Africa, and the Arawak Indian plan and elevation. The building technique of open bay framing and half timbering is French. However, a typical plan is one expansive room three or four rectangular rooms with an adjoining open hallway or no hallway built two to eight feet off the ground. You're looking at a little, a small amount of the interior of a shotgun house. Later in the century, there were variations. For example, houses with a half story are called camelback shotguns and there's double wide shotguns or double barrel shotgun houses. After 1860, English Victorian em embellishments were used to decorate the brackets, the eaves of the roofs, and the gables. Scholars disagree about the designs and where the shotgun house first appeared in the U.S., but they all agree that the shotgun house first appeared in the urban and rural south, eventually being associated with poor working class communities. By the mid-19th century, African-type houses with cob walls, wattle, dab, and wood fiber were rare. So this is a rare example of a slave house in Edgefield, South Carolina, built by Taro, whose slave name was Romeo. He was one of 409 slaves from the Congo Anglo Basin. Taro's slave house had a timber frame with lay walls held in place by twine netting. Inside, bundles of straw were hung vertically. The roof was covered with straw thatch. Basically, what you're looking at is a woven single room structure, seven feet by 10 feet with a door, no windows. And Taro said this was just like the one he had built for himself in Africa. Let's talk a little bit about what's called antebellum furniture. Fine European style furniture was made and sold in specialty shops in the cities or on plantations in what's called cabinet shops. Successful planners, businessmen, and their families who recently migrated from France, Spain, Germany, and England, they wanted finely made solid furniture that denoted their social status. The most popular pieces were marble top washstands, sleigh beds, four poster beds called in the South teaser beds. Chester of drawers, armoires, secretaries, whatnots, chairs, sofas. This beautiful, sophisticated cellurette is an excellent example of a slave having master cabinet making skills. Peter Lee, a slave of John Collins in Alabama, made this piece. Lee's skills reflected the slave owner's status and earned him respect in the slave community. Thomas Day was a free black cabinet maker who owned and operated one of North Carolina's most successful cabinet shops before the Civil War from 1823 until he died in 1861. Within a decade of opening his shop, he established himself as one of the state's preeminent furniture craftsmen and entrepreneurs. By 1850, Day was the fifth wealthiest man in Coswell County, North Carolina, mainly employing slave artisans in his shop. However, they trained both free and slave apprentices, but once they became sufficiently proficient, their masters removed them. So to secure a reliable labor force for his expanding business, which by the 19th century was the state's largest furniture making workshop, they purchased his own slaves. His creative work was widely recognized 
as outstanding and won him customers such as North Carolina's governors and a commission to furnish the interior woodwork of one of the original buildings of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. In this architectural work, Day employed many of the same design motifs in his furniture, playing again off his interpretation of the Greek revival. Overall, Day's architectural work, like his furniture craftsmanship, focuses on creating a balance of motion through complementary curvatures. Day was known for his mahogany pieces. He developed a empire of Greek revival designs. His distinctive signature is a pair of facing S scroll motifs, which are the bold design elements that you see in this secretary. And if you look at those two S's, S scroll uh, shapes, they remind you of the indinkra symbols that we saw in the metalwork from the last lecture that we discussed. This is another piece by Dave. This is an what's called an open pillar uh, bureau, and it's from 1855. It's made from mahogany, veneer over yellow pine and poplar. It's in the what's called the Greek style or the Grecian style. It's part of the collection of the North Carolina Museum of History. Uh, you can see the flared forms on either side of the mirror. Again, it echoes similar shapes that we saw in his uh, secretary as well as other forms. Uh, we will see those S shapes um, again in his. This is a dresser that was made by Day, and we can see that the legs also have that very, um, again, that motif of the facing S. And then this is a rocking chair. Uh, you can see um, that it also has some of the same similar S kind of shapes for the handle. It's just from 18, this is 1855, 1860 collection. Thomas Day remained in the South his entire life. In 1857, a national financial crisis destroyed one in three businesses. And Day's furniture shop was the largest in North Carolina at the time. It was also bankrupt. Thomas Day is North Carolina's most famous furniture craftsman and cabinet maker. Even today, He's considered one of the best cabinet makers in the world.